do of the MENA ICT Forum 2016. Yesterday we had uh, we had quite a, an eventful digital day. And again, if you if you kind of like what happened yesterday, that gave you some inspiration. I'm sure you're going to uh, enjoy what we have to, today. Again, if you are on uh, Twitter, on social media, please that hashtag very important indeed. MENA. ICT 2016, and uh, hopefully we can get to trending as much as possible. Yesterday, a, around the world yesterday, big news. There was big news, wasn't, wasn't there? Quite a big news indeed. Uh, new American president. Every single country in the world that was trending worldwide. That was number one. In Jordan, it was number two. Because number one was actually the MENA ICT 2016 hashtag. We were actually... That's right, clap for yourselves. Because, because it is, yeah, you, you guys were actually trending in Jordan. Hopefully, let's keep it going. And, uh, and again, if someone just has anybody at all that's maybe not connected uh, with the event, they just have to see that tweet and that perhaps will start a conversation somewhere and uh, move this event in the right direction. Okay, to kick off the morning, and we've got something quite special here as well to wake us all up. Um, also... And if you think everything that you've learnt about innovation in the last five years, okay, it's actually turned on its head. The gentleman that's going to tell you a lot more about that and explain exactly what I'm talking about is actually a, an entrepreneur, uh, an author, consultant, and also a former Green Beret, would you believe it? Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the co-founder of Maker Partners, Mr. Mark Hatch. So, um, I firmly believe that everything we knew about innovation has fundamentally changed in the last five years. I'm going to walk through that in a little bit. So, uh, as a former Green Beret, uh, one of the things I really enjoyed most about my time uh, there was uh, blowing things up. So, we, we learned uh, how to run revolutions and how to drive a revolution, and I believe we are in the middle of the most interesting revolution in all of human history. This, this revolution is going to make uh, the Renaissance and uh, the Gutenberg and everything else that we've been through look like child's play. Uh, if, again, if you thought the last five to ten years was interesting, the next five to ten are going to be even more interesting. So it, as it relates to blowing things up, I'm going to ask the audience to say boom on occasion just to keep our blood flowing. And I'm, there are going to be some really interesting things that I'm going to show you towards the end of the conversation that will, I hope, surprise you and you're going to want to participate. So just to practice, I want you to say boom on three. One, two, three. Boom! boom. Yes, baby! All right, let's do it again. One, one more time. One, two, three. Boom. boom! All right, let's get started. So I'm going to talk about a few things. This is a fairly deep topic. I've got 30 minutes, and so we're going to move through it very quickly. I'm going to talk about makerspaces, exponential technology trends, and the early impact that this combination of trends has had already in the U.S. and other parts of the world. I'm going to start with makerspaces. So I'm the CEO and co-founder of TechShop. I recently left to help actually drive the revolution harder. And a tech shop is 20,000 square feet of every tool you need to make anything on the planet. Every tool you need to make anything on the planet. We have 12 of them around the globe. We opened our first one in the Middle East in Abu Dhabi last summer. It's 15,000 square feet. It's $150 a month. What that means is for the cost of a Starbucks addiction, anybody can have access to the same tools that GE and Ford and other large industrial companies use to create prototypes and to build their business. We have never lived in an era where the average consumer had access to these tools. That just <laughs> happened in the last eight years. And as a result, some amazing things have been happening. So we do corporate events. Uh, we have a known good uh, expansion process and global reach. Our corporate events are a lot of fun. Lasers and beer, welding and wine, water jet and whiskey, power tools and alcohol. What could possibly go wrong? One, two, three, boom. Yeah, we don't let that happen. Um, next slide. There we go. So we have uh, machine tools. So standard industrial lathes. We let people come in off the street and after two or three hours learning how to use these tools, use our tools. An important component in that are computers. If you learn how to use the software that drives these tools, you can now produce things in plastic, metal, wood, electronics, and textiles. 
You can make just about anything after learning how to use just a, a couple simple software tools. The laser cutter is an incredibly powerful tool. We have people that have accidentally launched businesses after one class session on the laser cutter. Of course, we teach welding classes, we have 3D printers, we have a water jet, I love this thing. This thing will cut through five inches thick of anything on the planet. We'll teach you how to use it in two hours two hours, you download a two-dimensional file off the internet and you can cut things out of concrete, granite, titanium, cows, chickens, you name it, this thing cuts it. And it cuts it like butter. It's, it's a truly remarkable tool. That was cut on. It has a, a one one-thousandth of a kerf over a five-inch throw. It'll cut absolutely anything. Complete woodworking lab, complete textiles lab. We've had five companies launch, uh, uh, textile fashion companies. And plastic, that's an injection molding machine. Most importantly, what happens when you open one of these spaces is we attract the most creative people within the city to come in and hang out on a daily basis. That is the true magic. The tools are the honey that attracts the bees. And the real key is how do you get university professors, venture capitalists, startups, junior high kids, all hanging out together in one space, working on projects that they love. The way you do that is you build a 20,000 square foot space, you outfit it with 15 full-time employees, and you give them every tool they need to make anything on the planet. This isn't just a hardware accelerator. This is for artists. This is for kids that are trying to learn. This is for moms who are launching little craft businesses just trying to supplement a little bit of income and to reposition themselves within society. And building that community is by far the most important thing. And to do that, you need the space. And we're making progress. The President of the United States came and visited us in Pittsburgh a couple of years ago. He's had three maker fairs on site um, at the White House in the last uh, few years. It's become an important movement um, in the United States and growing around the world. So park that. The tools of the Industrial Revolution are now available to you for the cost of a Starbucks addiction. The next question is, okay, but what is the environment within which we're dropping this? And so there are six exponential technology fields. This comes out of the Singularity University folks, Peter Diamantas and Ray Kurzweil. I'm an adjunct faculty at Singularity University. These things are changing at increasingly exponential rates. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but this is very core. Biotech and bioinformatics, energy and environmental systems, networks and computing systems, AI and robots, medical and neuroscience and nanotechnology. These things are rapidly changing. I would encourage you to start holding this forum once every year and then once every six months, because I'm sorry, if you wait another two years, Everything that you've learned is going to fundamentally change in these fields in the next two years. You've got to be plugged in to the innovation ecosystem knowledge around the globe, and waiting every two years to have that conversation is a little bit too long. So these are the exponential fields, but let me keep going. Here's what's really changed. We can now do research and prototyping very inexpensively. Our customers tell us that they save 98% of their development cost by doing it themselves. What that means is what used to take a million dollars from a venture capitalist now takes $10,000 from family and friends to launch a business. Accelerators, there are hardware accelerators now. Unfortunately, there are only about 13 of them around the world. This is a huge opportunity. You could open one of the very first hardware accelerators in all of the Middle East and North Africa, and you could do it in the next nine months. Finance has changed, manufacturing has changed, marketing has changed, and sales has changed. What is left when you're trying to launch a business? Let me get into this. So we've helped to open three locations around, the, or two locations around the globe. This is an innovation center in St. Louis, Washington University, Purina, Monsanto, and others helped to fund that one. Utenheimertum in uh, Munich was funded partially by BMW and by the university. Again, on the ground floor, you've got 20,000 square feet access to every tool that you need. On the next floor is a, typically a hardware accelerator, software accelerator, and on the top floor is, is space for people to be able to work and collaborate. So that's an incubators, innovation centers, and maker spaces and fab labs. There's a fab lab here on campus, is my understanding. These are great educational platforms, and they are on ramps to this upcoming innovation revolution. We now have accelerators. I mentioned there are only about 13 of them around the world. Uh, three of them launched next to our San Francisco location um, a few years ago. So you've got Alpha uh, Gear, you've got Lemnos. What's really interesting is, the, is Flex. Um, and uh, where's the other one? I don't see it there. Flextronics. So this is the second largest integrated 
uh, contract manufacturer on the planet, and they have a hardware accelerator embedded in their startup ecosystem. So if you have a great idea, they have this thing called Sketch to Scale, you can come to them and they will take it from Sketch and run it through their professional research and development arm, their professional manufacturing, and they will actually help you put it on the shelf. You can go from having an idea to having something on Walmart's shelves in 12 months. That has never existed in all of human history. You've never been able to walk into a facility, say, here's my idea, and it's going to be on the Walmart shelf in 12 months, unless you were a GE or unless you were a Sony or an Apple. Now this is available to anybody with a great idea. One, two, three, boom. So we also have finance, right? Self-funding, Kickstarters, AngelList, the Jobs Act. These have fundamentally changed, at least in the United States, particularly the Jobs Act. We've raised $5 million in $25,000 increments from people who care about the maker movement across the United States. We've had the most recent Kickstarter was a laser cutter. Uh, they called it a laser printer. It was a $30 million fundraising. And Flex is now their manufacturing partner, and they're actually already shipping. This thing is only about 18 months old from concept to delivery. We have manufacturing. So you can do manufacturing in maker spaces, you can do it in JBill, you can do it in Dragon, you can do it in China, you can do short runs in your own uh, maker spaces. You've also got marketing now. Again, this has fundamentally changed. You used to have to be able to take advertising out, you had to do radio, you had to go to trade shows, no more. You could now do Google, Facebook, Instagram, you do key influencers, you get Robert Scoble to, to tweet you, you get some other folks to tweet you, and all of a sudden you now have access to markets that you've never had before. Talk about cheap. This stuff is free. You impact your network, you get them to impact their network, and you can now take your products out to the entire region or across the entire globe for free. And then, of course, we've got sales, and this has fundamentally changed as well. Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Gromit, actually direct and retail. When I grew up, we had to go through uh, a buyer at a local retailer, and trying to get a startup in front of a buyer at the time was next to impossible. Now you can take your products direct. And in fact, Walmart and Brookstone and others realize that they are so far behind, they have teams that are focused on trying to find the next big thing. It's easier now to get distribution than we have ever seen, again, in all of human history. And you don't even have to do that. You can go direct, thanks to the web. You can go on Etsy or Gromit. You can do all kinds of different things. So what did I just cover? Like, in the last five years, most of this stuff didn't exist. We now have these six exponential fields, we have access to manufacturing capacity, we got research, accelerators, finance, manufacturing, marketing, and sales for almost nothing. A 98% reduction in the cost of taking a company into the market. And you go, right, Mark, that's a bunch of theory, that's very interesting. Now let's get real. This is my personal experience. These are companies that I know, these are people that I know personally over the last about six years. It's a nice little slide, let's get into the first one. That's Ken Hawthorne, that is the world's fastest electric motorcycle. It did 218 miles an hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats two years ago. It won Pikes Peak this last year, which is the second oldest race in the United States. It not only beat all the other electric motorcycles, it destroyed the entire motorcycle field. The Italian Ducati Monster came in second place 20 seconds after this motorcycle came across the finish line. When was the last time you ever heard of a professional race where the second place finisher came in after the first guy had a massage and a beer? Like, this guy finished so early, it was stunning. This entire thing was built from the ground up in a makerspace in our tech shop in Menlo Park. The carbon fiber fairing, the aluminum frame, the engine. You can't go out and buy an electric superbike engine. You have to build it yourself. The transmission, all of the electronics, all of the wiring, the seat. Because if you had to go to an upholster, it might have taken two or three weeks to get that stupid seat back. And instead, you just go into the textiles room and build the seat in the same day. You can collapse development times by six months, one year, two years. I can talk about GE, how they've shifted one of their manufacturing ideation processes from a 18-month to three-year process of $200 million to a six-month process and a few million dollars. This stuff is real. It's happening now. Britt Moran came in. She didn't know how to make anything. She then launched a lifestyle company called Brit & Co. She just raised $26 million in her Series B. She just launched her products across all of the Target stores in the US. Hallmark is now one of her partners. She's on television on the Today Show about three times a month. 
When she came in, she literally didn't know how to make anything. She took about 30 classes over about um, a four-month period, then launched her company, and now she's worth tens of millions of dollars just on, on the products that she's working on. David came in and said, I don't know how to make anything either, um, but I want to learn. So he took a bunch of our classes and eventually launched a robot company. This guy went from not knowing how to make anything, and nine months later, he owns an underwater robot company. One, two, three, boom. Max came in and said, like, I, you know, I want to own a lamp company. This is one of the things that's interesting. Like, I know, he's 26, 28 years old. There is no venture capitalist or angel group on the planet that would have funded this. So this is interesting. We now live in an era where you can launch lifestyle businesses. You do not have to talk to anybody about an exit. Mom doesn't want an exit. She just wants to make a little money to help to get the kids in, into some clothing or to get, get, you know, get a present for birthdays. These platforms don't require that you are trying to get to a unicorn status. There's actually more money below the surface than there is above the surface for that. Max launched his company. Um, he eventually ended up on Shark Tank, which is where you stand, you know, stand in front of five guys. And they bid him, they, all five of them bid him. He went and said, my company's worth $3 million. I need $300,000 to be able to pay for my inventory. He was given a $6 million valuation, $300,000 in equity, and an unlimited line of credit to handle his inventory. One, two, three, boom. Uh, I, I mentioned about robots, so this is crazy. Uh, this is a robot that will produce four, 600 ro uh, hamburgers an hour. Um, this is probably going to eliminate 600,000 jobs in the United States alone. It was built uh, initially um, at CMU, and then they moved to the Bay Area to actually develop it. It's called Momentum Machines. Uh, look them up. This is the robotics part of the, uh, the curve. Um, then these guys actually, they also came out of CMU. This is a sandwich making machine. This thing is crazy. It looks like a, you know, some kind of wild contraption where you've got like, you've got, uh, you know, chicken and beef and peanut butter and jelly and mayonnaise and you name it. And this thing, you starts out with the bread on one end and out comes a sandwich on the other. This will probably eliminate about 300,000 jobs in the United States. Patrick came in and asked, what classes do I need to take to build an iPad case out of bamboo and book binding? He took three classes in one week, launched a company, and did a million dollars in sales in the first quarter. He didn't know how to use the tools, learned what he needed, launched his company, and closed a million dollars in the first quarter. He did four million in the first year, 10 million in the second, 50 million in the third. We think he's doing over hundred million dollars a year now. He's got a manufacturing facility inside of San Francisco. This is like an urban regrowth, an urban renewal opportunity. You can learn what you need in weeks or months to be able to start a company. And actually, the president of the United States is his uh, lead user. Um, somebody bought it for him early. It was, it was really quite remarkable. But let me make a note here. None of the things I've just showed you have changed the world. One might think that if you gave the tools of the Industrial Revolution to the middle class for the first time in human history, they might change the world. And in fact, they have. Square came out of our Menlo location. What people don't know about this story is that Jack Dorsey and James McKelvey were turned down the first time that they went and talked to ostensibly the smartest investors on the planet. That's right, they went in and talked to the 10 top guys in the Silicon Valley, said, I've got this idea, and they were turned down flat. Namely because Jack was a coder and James was a glass blower from St. Louis. What does a glass blower from St. Louis know about credit cards? Well, it turns out he was turned down. His bank told him that he couldn't take American Express cards from his customers. And I'm sorry, but we do not live in an era where your bank gets to tell you what form of payment your customers want to pay you in. And one of the reasons is because he got fed up with it, went to the Silicon Valley and pitched his idea. More importantly, he then came to our location, learned how to use the tools, learned the basic electronics, leveraged the community, and built the prototype that got them their $10 million in their seed. And here's what I really love about it. They went back to these guys, and they didn't do a PowerPoint. They just walked in with their phone and the, and the dongle and said, give me your credit card. Right? So the guys hooked out their black American Express card, ran it through, put in 50 bucks. They took 50 bucks off each of the top 10 VCs and didn't give the money back. <laughs> I love that. One, two, three. Boom. First time I've ever heard of a, a startup charging a VC for a meeting. Uh, MakerBot came out of our movement. That's Bree Pettis. It was a $600 million exit. Five years before his exit, he was a junior high art teacher. We live in an era where if you're a junior high art teacher, 
You can move to a major city. You can get access to the facilities that you need. And you can change the world. He commercialized the idea of consumer-grade print 3D printers. And he was an art teacher. The cognitive surplus that we have in our cities around the globe, the capacity of the human mind, is the largest untapped resource on the planet. How do we tap into it? And the way we do that is we give them facilities and we give them education, we give them training, we give them just a little bit of a push, and they will do remarkable things, things like Brie Pettis did. And we have, these are three other technologies I won't go into um, that have also changed the world in their own right. This one is my favorite. It's a portable incubation blanket that Jane Chen came up with. This thing has saved 250,000 babies so far. What happens when you give the tools of the Industrial Revolution to the middle class and you give them a little bit of support that they need? They change the world. One, two, three, boom. boom. So here's the impact in the Bay Area. Six billion dollars in shareholder value have been created from the three locations that ran us about 30 million dollars. 2,000 jobs, $200 million in annual salaries. The state of California makes 10% of that on an annual basis. So the state of California is making more money annually just on the income than it costs us to open two of our locations. And when that $6 billion is turned over in shareholder value, that means the state is going to pick up another $600 million. Our best estimate is the state of California is going to pick up between $800 and $1.2 billion dollars from a $30 million investment. And this actually shouldn't surprise us, because this platform and the era that we're living in is unique to human history. We've never had access to this kind of powerful tools. We've never had access to the software that you can learn how to use in a couple of weeks that will enable you to produce things in steel, in plastic, in textiles, in electronics. But now we do. So, my focus, so here's, so like we've got the exponential tech I talked about, you've got maker spaces, and you've got hardware. This is an enormous opportunity. I love software, and, and Andreessen says software is eating the world, but the, real, the world is made up of physical things. You know, it's called cyber physical. And so it's coming into the physical realm, and what's fascinating is we don't need a lot of knowledge to have an incredible amount of impact in the physical world. We just need access to the platforms. So what am I doing? I am consulting and speaking on this particular topic. I'm doing research on this topic because there's a dearth of information, quantitative uh, information uh, related to it. And I've started a venture capital fund because I'm actually trying to put money into these startups that are doing absolutely amazing things. So welcome to the innovation revolution. I hope you join me. One, two, three, <laughs> boom. Thank you so much. In fact, just before you go, perhaps I'm sure there are perhaps people in the room that maybe will ask, I'd like to pose a question of something that they've heard from Mark this morning. Any questions, perhaps? Hi, thanks. That was a great talk. Um, so I'm wondering about regulation and how it uh, affects your ability to get the machines into the different places that you want to operate in, specifically in the region. You mentioned you opened up in Abu Dhabi. I know some other makerspaces have had trouble getting 3D printers in and uh, just wondered about your, your experience. So um, the, uh, the answer is you start at the top. So you, you come in at a very senior governmental level and you get them to help uh, a bust open the doors. So the maker, the maker movement um, is very much a ground up kind of a phenomenon. And as a result, that creates a lot of issues in that often the spaces are, are too small to drive economic development. They have all kinds of regulation that they have to deal with. It may be impossible to get insurance, which in the United States is a really big deal. And so as part, of, as part of the objective, what you want to do is you want to create an entire ecosystem that supports the large centers as well as the maker spaces around and paves the way so that they don't have these kinds of issues. Because we need a maker space, maybe a small one, in every junior high school, every high school, every university should have a major one, and every city should have a large one downtown where the people who aren't plugged into those other things have an opportunity to gather and change their community. Great question. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for a great presentation. You shocked us and all us more than uh, Trump's winning. Uh, my colleague and I were talking about how can we get something of this magnitude, this, this great venture started in Jordan, knowing that we do have 
uh, uh, I don't know if you've seen them, uh, the innovation centers. But this is completely different. This is, we're talking about vocational innovation, something completely wild and crazy. How do you think a country like Jordan should start with something like that? I, I think you can take some of the existing resources and, and just tweak them a little bit. Uh, the key piece to this is open access and then the educational lever to teach, level to teach people how to use it. You already have uh, maker spaces uh, in Jordan. There's already a small maker movement. You know, like we, we, one, we need to tap into that. The next thing is we've got to free up capital. And like I mentioned, every major educational institution, if they want to be competitive globally, is going to have to put in a 10 to 20 to 30,000 square foot innovation center. This world is changing, and without it, your education is, it isn't going to be as valuable. Since that money is already going to be spent, the trick is to make sure that you work it so that it has the open access components to it. Like that's, that's what I believe. Yeah. Just a comment before I pass it to my, to my colleague, uh, actually, for next question. On regulation, the government just decided yesterday to, to allow all 3D printers to get in town without any trouble and uh, treat it as computers. So they left all uh, regulations that were put on it yesterday. That's good, but we also need CNC mills, which you typically have to buy from out, uh, you know, outside of the region, and a 35% tariff on that will reduce the ability to have a bunch of them. So there's, there are a bunch of technologies that need to be able to be uh, positioned, um, and it's not, all, it's not always easy. It took, it took us three months to sort some of the stuff out in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, once again, put your hands together for Mark Hatch. So again, remember, remember everything that you see